Hey there Wargamers, Austin here with Deathray Designs and today we're going to look at a brand new set of bases that we're launching for Infinity and Warhammer 40k called the Streets of New Series. I thought we'd go ahead and paint up a handful of these bases just as our testers and maybe even for the photography models for the website and I thought you guys might enjoy coming along and seeing how we do it. So I know that the outside of this sheet looks a little bit rough here. We just uh, we did it on a piece of scrap here and uh, you can see this is another one of our two-layer bases, um, just like our Mesotech and uh, Tech Core. You're going to have a, an upper layer right here that's got some tile and a little bit of curb. And then down here we've got this mesh kind of texture, and I think that'll be really nice for some dry brushing. It also just looks like an interesting techy kind of maybe even alien uh, pattern. So it would be pretty good for, you know, Warhammer 40k. I guess you could paint it up as an imperial thing, but I think this would look really nice as some type of Xenos thing. And it would look right at home with just about any of the um, Infinity armies because they have a very similar look and feel. At least they, they can mesh well with most high-tech sci-fi kind of looks. So each one of these, like I said, has got uh, an upper and a lower, and we're gonna figure out what color scheme we're gonna go with. I'm always a little bit partial to the uh, the cream color, orange, and like a dark charcoal gray. I think that's a really um, striking color combination. Uh, not quite as punchy as you know red on black, uh, but I think that it's 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 got some really great opportunities for weathering, and I, I love to do weathering. So we're going to probably pop some of these out and tape them down to the desk and. Um, do a little bit of, of airbrushing here, but I think that we can probably go ahead and start off by doing a base coat while they're still in the frame. Um, and we'll probably do a, a brown and white sort of beige-ish color um, in the beginning. And then we can work up from that brown to uh, a beige and orange and that charcoal gray will pretty much just cover up anything that we want. So let's get started on that. We've loaded up a little bit of Minotaur bark into our Patriot 105 and I'm just gonna do a light coverage over the whole thing here. We're not really looking to have this be completely opaque. I just want to start having it lean tonally a little bit away from pure black and go for more of um, brown undertones because I think it's going to mesh really well with the majority of the colors that we're going to be using on this project. Okay. All right, so it's a little bit uneven and I don't have full coverage, but we're just doing an undercoat um, and it's not going to, to be critical that we have a totally flat, opaque undercoat. So we'll just stop there and we'll start switching over to some other colors as soon as these dry. Since our tiles are actually gonna be a beige color, I've grabbed the cracked soil and I'm gonna put a light coat of that on top of all the tile that are up on the second level and once that's dry, we'll mask over that and then start working on the curb pieces and possibly pop out the lower sections and just paint those separately. So here we go. And once again, we're not trying to get an entirely opaque coat here. It's okay to have it be a little uneven because I'm planning on doing some weathering on this, but if you're looking for a really clean tile, um, Feel free to do several thin coats uh, to, to achieve whatever finish you're looking for. So now we've got a pretty decent coat of this uh, beige color on top. Um, and it's honestly uh, choked out most of the, the brown undertone that we put on it. Um, but we'll probably come back in with a little bit of uh, weathering or shading right at the end and try to bring a little bit of that back in. Um, that said, I can still see a little bit of speckling in there, but I like the, the organic look of that. It makes it feel a little bit more real and a little less plastic toy-y, you know? I'm taking all of the pieces out of the frame now. The lower areas, we don't need to paint quite yet, uh, but the upper areas, some of the things that I want to do, I want to make sure that I get some paint on the edges, and it's hard to get the edges when they're still in the frame. So I'm going to take those out, and we're going to do a little rolled over tape on the edge of our little sheet here and use that to help hold them in place while we paint. Okay, so there's one. 
Here's two. I'm going to spread them out a little bit just so that I don't necessarily get a lot of overspray. And we'll put the last one over here on the side. Cool. Excellent, excellent. And technically, if you didn't take the back paper off, you could super glue them down and then just peel them away and it'll all just be stuck to the paper afterwards. Because most of the angles that we're working with here are nice, even angles, there's no curves, I'm gonna use masking tape as opposed to using frisket film, um, just because masking tape is really inexpensive and plentiful generally, and you don't need to waste uh, super expensive, hard to come by frisket film for straight angles. Though to get into some of these interior corners like this, I like to cut my tape at an angle with a pair of scissors and then try to get that point right in the corner and lay that in. And then especially on pieces where it's right at the edge, you can just take the little piece you snipped off, flip it over and let's make sure we get it lined up correctly. That line, there we go. So now we got that part covered and the rest should be a breeze. Take knife come in here and cut out this little tiny area that was overlapping there we go oh you gotta stay away you're not invited anymore you gotta leave all right so now we can actually see the edges of things here uh, for when we are going to put some more paint down um, and before we do that I'm actually just gonna rough up that edge just a teeny tiny bit with a little piece of sandpaper just to make sure that we get good paint adhesion. There we go. On this one, let's reposition that out to the edge. Okay. Getting it now. Get that all the way out here to the edge. There we go, very nice. So to start with, I'm gonna do, looks like warning yellow here. We'll do warning yellow as kind of our, um, our starter orange. And then we'll go into something a little bit more intense in a minute. So we're just gonna go thin coats here. Don't wanna pull it on. There we go. And over here. Okay, this is definitely a very yellowy orange, um, but it's also a little bit more subdued than uh, some super intense oranges that you might find elsewhere, uh, which we will be calling upon for their assistance momentarily. Okay, got those edges. Okay, those are looking pretty consistent, and I like the, the overall look that we've got so far. Let's dump out what's left in here, and we're gonna grab some super duper bright orange. So may, as you may have seen in episodes past, I like to use Montana acrylic paints. Um, these are meant for uh, refilling paint pens, but I think that they've got these really great intense colors meant for graffiti and street art and all that jazz. Um, and uh, it just happens to run through an airbrush super, super well. So let's load up a little bit of that and this isn't the brightest orange that we could use but it is lighter and I think that we can get some some sort of lighting effects here um, there we go just trying to get sort of the middles of things kind of brighten those up a touch if we're feeling frisky we might actually go for one of those even brighter oranges just as a little tiny pop of highlight here. Make sure to get those edges. Okay. And yeah, let's let's go for let's go for the crazy one. So we've got this neon like fluorescent orange that it like it almost hurts to look at. But when used in moderation, it's it's an excellent tool for brightening up an area without making it look too cartoony. So dump the rest of that out. And because we're trying to do a subdued effect, I don't mind so much that there's still a little bit of the other orange still in the color cup, um, because it'll help tone that down just a little bit. There we go. Got him. 
So let's pick a couple of spots here. I'm gonna go for the, the middle here where I want it to be the brightest. I'm gonna go real slow here. Okay, that's about all I want. I'm gonna try to get a little on the edge too though. That is a super duper intense kind of thing here. So I think I'm gonna come in kind of at an angle here and maybe create a little bit of a hot spot right in there. Yeah, I don't want any more than that because it's gonna look real, real crazy if I go too much more than that. And let's pick a couple of spots here. Let's get this corner here and then maybe somewhere in this leg over here on this side. Just feather that out just a tiny bit and make sure we get some on the edges. I think that's pretty much it. We're, we're looking good there. On to the next step, we've got to get some gray on these guys and then probably do a little bit of shading, dry brushing on that, assemble them, do a little bit of weathering, and they're good to go. And, um, you know, if I wasn't thinking about exactly what colors to use at this point, um, you, could, you could knock out tons of this really, really quickly. These, these types of toppers really lend themselves well, especially the multi-layer ones where you can break stuff up, airbrush or spray paint them separately. Um, it, it just doesn't have to take a long time to do custom basing. I'm gonna re-black these out, but before we do that, I'm going to uh, use a little bit of 220 grit sandpaper here on the edges and just make sure that we don't have any little uh, burrs or little mold pieces, or I'm sorry, like basically the, the points where it was attached to the frame, those can sometimes stick out a little bit. Plus we wanna rough up the edge just to make sure that paint sticks to them really well. And even when you do that, you'll wanna make sure to seal these at the end because um, even if you rough these edges up, um, this, uh, when you're putting paint straight down onto the acrylic that hasn't been uh, primed, um, it, can, it can rub off if you're using it or you're, you're touching it a whole lot. Um, so just you know, a coat of sealer at the end should, should do the trick. Once again, I'm using uh, Montana um, for the, the blacking out here, but you don't have to. Um, Honestly, most of the time, the, the brand of paints that you're using isn't super important as long as they work well with your brush or your airbrush. Um, just use what you have and what you're comfortable with. I like the Montana paints just because they're super opaque and they help me paint faster. Um, but um, there's plenty of other companies out there that, that do great stuff. Uh, Minotaur, um, Justin and I, and just about everybody else in the studio use Minotaur for lots and lots of stuff. Um, I don't know what all they can see over here, but there's like a pile of Minotaur paints in the, the paint cart here. But we also have some, you know, Vallejo and whatever. Um, so if you see somebody doing something cool with a paint job, uh, don't, don't hesitate to try to imitate it without knowing exactly what brand they used. Sometimes that's helpful if they're doing like a really technical technique, but um, you know, just use your best judgment. So now we got our coat of black down and it really doesn't take much of this um, the other super opaque black that I like to use um, when I'm re-blacking out things and I don't want to add a ton of paint is also FW Ink Black. That stuff is great. It is just scary how opaque it is. You can add like a teeny tiny drop of it to a very large quantity of paint and it's basically black now. Um, does not take much at all. Once again, back to some Montana. I swear I'm not sponsored by them. Um, this is the gravel, um, I, and I like this just because it's a really dark gray. Um, it goes really nicely on top of black, and um, it's very smooth. You get a nice transition. We're not really interested in painting a whole lot on the area that's flat here, um, because at least in the way that we're constructing this right now, those are gonna be covered up by the other pieces. We also make other bases where essentially it's a two-layer base, and the bottom layer is just the, the top of the, the actual plastic base that came with the model. Um, so in the sense, you could actually split this up and get twice as many bases uh, if you just wanted to put you know, some kind of uh, paint texture or use a stencil on the flat upper. But in this situation, we're gonna be covering that up, so I'm not gonna worry too much about it. Um, so I'm thinking that I'm gonna keep my gray towards the middle of the base so that the middle of the base is lighter and the outside rim is a little darker. So you got, got this spotlight effect on your model. So let's start right here in the middle. And we're not gonna go too crazy. I'm gonna turn this around just so that I'm getting some of the other facets of the insides of this grading area. So we're gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna come in here. 
Now, one thing to keep in mind though, though this area, this, this flat back here is not going to be seen, the area on this side of the line nearest to the texture will be seen. So uh, make sure that whatever is there isn't, isn't messy, it looks nice. Um, and I like just with the grading, you're gonna have a brighter gray in the middle and it's gonna go to black at the edge and we'll dry brush it. Um, but it's a really simple effect and it takes weathering really nicely afterwards. Okay. Rock on. So let's bring back in our little orange and cream pieces here. And I'm gonna take the, the tape off. Now let's see how this all looks. All right, it's looking pretty cool. Peel the tape off the back. Let's lay this out and see how we're looking. All right, that is looking pretty cool. Um, now let's get our little slice there for that one. Also looking nice. And this little sort of tooth looking piece here. All right, all right. Yeah, I'm really digging that, looks cool. Um, we got a couple little places that we could touch up if we wanted to, um, but I think that I'll worry about that in the weathering step and we'll probably just apply a little bit of extra weathering in that area and it'll uh, hide our crimes, as the great Adam Savage would say. All right, um, time to peel off the backers here and I like to leave them on up through this step just because it helps protect the, the back and make sure you don't get a ton of paint on it. It's already bad enough trying to glue uh, one surface down onto um, something covered in acrylic paint, but you know if you've just got tons and tons on both sides, um, you may not get the best and most permanent adhesion. I'm gonna take the same piece of sandpaper and we're gonna just lightly sand the, uh, the back side of this. You know, while I'm doing this, I, I'm just now realizing that I didn't talk about the prep that we did before you guys uh, started uh, watching us here. And um, that was that we took this same 220 sandpaper, lightly sanded the surface just to make sure that um, any of the debris from the cutting process was removed. And then we hit it with a little bit of black enamel primer, flat black enamel primer. It's the same stuff that we recommend for MDF. Um, you can also use the Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch 2X. Um, either of those work just fine. It was just one coat, by the way. It's, you don't need more than one on the acrylic. All right. And the reason that I'm sanding the other side is just um, I find that super glue adheres to uh, a lightly roughed up surface a little bit better than a perfectly smooth one. So now it's time to glue them down. And we want to make sure that we get them exactly on the line that is inscribed on here. So otherwise, it's going to look a little weird. So let's start with the large one first. Um, and I'm gonna apply a little bit of super glue onto the back side here. No, I'm not because it's clogged. Of course. All right. So now for real, we're gonna put some glue on here. There we are, just a little bit. You don't wanna put so much on there that you are, um, you're gonna have it squeeze out around the edges too much. And if you feel like you've gotten too much on there, I like to um, just take a, a little piece of napkin or something and just kinda dab a little bit of it off. Um, you can also use this uh, method to smooth it around a little bit in case uh, you feel like you've gotten just too much in one area. Okay, so we're going to find that line there. Okay, we got it on the line. We got it around the edge. Okay, cool. And don't let me, that last part, scare you. It's, it's not hard to get it lined up, but it does look best when it all is smooth around the edge and you don't have any weird lines. So. That's one down, let's get the other two real quick and then we can mount them onto some bases. There we go. So we've got our three bases there and we've got a generally pretty clean um, look to them at the moment. If you wanted something super clean, you could stop here, but you could stop at this point and be fine, but I'm gonna take it a little bit further and do some weathering real quick. And this part is super quick and easy, but I think it adds a lot to it. So I'm gonna grab a dry brush and something relatively light. This is white cyanide res primer. Um, I like it because it's just a little bit on the, the viscous side. It's thin enough to go through an airbrush, but it's a little bit thicker than your average um, 
airbrush paint. So it's always what I reach for if I'm trying to do a white dry brush. All right, so just making sure we don't have too much of an excess of white on the brush. I'm gonna go over some of these details, especially right around the edges where the details will catch that paint. Just come at it from a couple different angles just because there's lots of weird angles within this texture. Um, and then we can do a little bit of a light dry brush right there at the curb. That's not showing up super duper well, just because the orange is a pretty light color as it is. Okay. All right. So we've got just a little bit there. Come back around the edge, and we're gonna repeat on the other bases real quick. So now, if we wanted to take this even further, and we wanted to add some, some weathering, and because I'm a klutz and I got a fingerprint in the top of this big one, I do want to do a little bit of weathering to help hide some of that. Um, there are a couple of things that we can do to help make this look a little bit older, a little dirtier, and help cover up any mistakes that we made. So, one of the things uh, that's always one of my trusty go-tos is Ghost Tint Brown. And because we were trying to make the centers look a little bit brighter and the outsides look a little bit darker, um, I would recommend if you're going to use a ghost tint like this or any other kind of candy color, um, I like putting it just around the rim, especially up here on the light area because um, that's where you're going to see it the most. That and on the, the orange. So just a little bit around that edge. There we go. I think that really gives it an, an extra nice little bit of character here. So let's repeat on this one here. This one's not got a whole lot of area to do it on, so we want to make sure that we keep that confined to that edge. And then over here, we got just a teeny tiny little spot to hit. There we go. That's looking pretty good now. We got those three with a little bit of, of just extra shading on top. Uh, doesn't take much time, uh, not hard to do, but we can still do a little bit more uh, in uh, just some chipping. So I'm always a fan of Dark Shadow, which is a really dark brown color from Reaper. Um, and I'm gonna just put a little bit right here on the paper in front of me, and grab a little piece of foam. So this is the same kind of foam that you would see in a battle foam bag or just any kind of, you know, KR, carry case, whatever. Um, you can also probably find big blocks of it at a fabric store and just pinch off little pieces as you need it. It's great for this kind of stuff. I've got just a teeny tiny piece of foam here and I'm gonna just do a little bit of sponging right around the edge of one of these tiles. Like maybe it's raised up just a little bit and maybe it gets a lot of scuffs because people, you know, catch their toe or catch their rolling bag on it all the time. Um, maybe we'll, we'll find another little spot here or there in the surrounding area to add a little bit of grime, add a little bit of weathering. And then maybe, maybe we also put a little bit right there on the edge of that curb. It's looking really nice and bright orange right now, but maybe it gets beaten up and kicked every single day as people walk over it and drag things over it, run their cars into it. So there we go, we got that one. And now we can repeat some of this on the 40 mil as well. I'll just throw a little bit of this on here. Just a couple tiny little spots. And then maybe a little bit on the actual tile up here. And we'll throw just a little out in the middle there too. Cool. All right, and we got this piece of curb that's jutting out in the middle of everywhere. So you know what? It's catching a lot of feet. There we go. One of the last things I like to do is use some uh, washes. Uh, a lot of times I use Citadel. Um, they're excellent washes for what they are. And the Agrax Earthshade is a must for almost any kind of weathering. Um, I like to throw this on at the end just because uh, you can, once you've put those chipped spots where grimy stuff has been caked in or paint's been chipped off, um, as, as water runs over it, if it's metal, then you'll get rust water running all over the place and corroding or at least discoloring the paint around it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in here and just do a little tiny bit of that. This is not a precision brush. This is just a you know, El Cheapo kind of, kind of affair here. And we're just gonna put a little bit of wash in in a few places. And I'm 
I don't necessarily have to be super duper careful with where I'm putting it right now, um, but I do need to work relatively quickly um, because we're gonna pull a lot of this back off in a second here. So we've gotten it kind of up next to the curb here. Maybe we throw a little on here, a little here. And more or less what I'm trying to do is let this dry just enough so that um, we get some dried down to the paint. And then I'm going to, you can, if you wanna take off a lot, grab a paper towel. If you wanna just sort of move it around and blend it, you can use your finger to kind of just dab at it and push some, some of it around. But, you know, don't leave big old fingerprints in it. Okay, I'm gonna kind of just use some, some little swirly motions here and try to move some of this around and make sure that it doesn't look like we just poured wash onto the, the concrete here. Okay, yeah, okay. And now once it's set up just a little bit more, you can find a few areas to kind of wipe some of it away and give it, yeah, there we go. So some of the stuff that you definitely don't want to happen on models where you put a bunch of wash on and then you accidentally remove some after the rim has started drying because it leaves rings actually looks pretty good when you're weathering terrain or bases and, and the like. So that one is looking pretty good. And I think that I'm probably gonna stop here. Um, I, may, I may work to remove a little bit more of that wash just to, to give us a, an interesting little effect. But like I said, you don't have to do this step if you like it cleaner or you liked some of the weathering steps that I took, but not all of them. That's just fine too. Your bases are for your models and only you know what's best for them. So there we go. Nice and quick on that guy. And then the last one, yeah, let's just throw some on there and kind of smush it around with our finger. Just want to get a little bit of discoloration around some of these areas. Okay, so now that we're all done, you can see our finished product here. I've got them set on top of uh, some uh, bases for each of their sizes, and I think they look uh, pretty nice. I'm really excited about these, and I think they turned out pretty well. Thank you so much for hanging out with me while I painted these. If you enjoyed the video, definitely leave us a like and subscribe to the channel. We're coming out with content like this all the time, so uh, if you want to see more painting tutorials and battle reports, uh, definitely give us a like and a subscribe, turn the bell on, all that good YouTube stuff. And if you're watching this over on Facebook, leave us a comment and tell us what you think about these new bases. I personally can't wait to uh, start using them for the towel project that I'm working on and over in Infinity Land, I'm thinking I might stick some of my new Nomads on them. So. These are on the website right now. Go check them out. The Streets of New Series over at deathraydesigns.com. Um, see them and all the rest of our basing stuff. I'm sure we've got something for whatever project you're working on. Thank you again, and until next time, happy wargaming. Mm -hmm.